in the marketplace of ideas, which increasingly seems to be the model for higher education. Words like entrepreneurial, competition, excellence, innovation, and on and on are heard on this campus and others as descriptors of the values and logics that drive learning and the production of knowledge. I mention this for several reasons. First, this is a political season in which the value of the free market is a hotly contested political issue. Bill Clinton was in town last night for a rally and conducted a 40-minute teach-in on the relationship between government policy and economic growth. Second, tomorrow in this very auditorium, the Architecture School will begin a two-day symposium about urban development in wheat market cities, another aspect of today's economics and politics. And third, at this very moment, Angela Davis, the former communist and icon of 1960s radicalism, is speaking just across campus. But we choose to be here tonight. And I'd like to suggest that it does not necessarily reveal political timidity or disinterest, not if we actually believe that design really matters. And the work and career of our guests tonight, I believe, proves that point. James Carpenter came of age as an artist and an architect precisely at the moment that Angela Davis was pushing the limits of political speech in and beyond the university. And the work he does today, some of which he describes as, quote, focused on the transformation of the urban environment in the public realm, is necessarily political in perhaps subtle ways, as was his early work in film and installation art. One dimension of this follows the 1970s feminist axiom, the personal is the political. Carpenter's deeply personal choices to switch from architecture to art as a student at RISD, then to make conceptually complex, highly structured films featuring animals, from humans to birds to fish, in artificial or artifice-framed environments, then to commit himself to research on the potential of glass as a mediating material of light, of subjective interaction, and of spatial ecologies, and as a medium of architecture, and then to found a design studio, James Carpenter Design Associates, devoted to pushing the limits of glass construction and to organize that studio not as a conventional architecture office, but instead, in his words, as a, as a collaborative environment encouraging an, an exchange of ideas between architects, materials and structural engineers, uh, environmental engineers and fabricators, and ultimately to produce work, usually for buildings designed by others, but almost always uh, more sophisticated in its spatial effects and technical means than those buildings, is an amazing case study in the politics of transdisciplinary <coughs> practice. Another dimension involves the profound status of glass itself as a trope of modernism and modern architecture. Carpenter's works take us far beyond the simplistic ideas of transparency that were both celebrated and ridiculed as the heart of modernism and he began to explore the politically charged issues of effect, environment, subjectivity, privacy, and atmosphere decades before they became the preoccupations that they are today. So I think he has a lot to teach us. He's been widely recognized for his work and his research, including the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2004, the Willem Foundation and Bellux Foundation Daylighting and Building Components Award in 2010, the Benedictus Award in 2002, an Academy Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2008, a National Environmental Design Award from the Smithsonian Institution and the Cooper Hewitt in 2002, and many, many awards from both architecture and engineering societies for the design of individual products. We're lucky to have him here tonight. Please join me in welcoming James Carpenter. Is that on now? Can you hear that? Is that amplified? No? That's on? Yeah, you. There you go. OK, great. Uh, Mark, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, Mark's field and specific area of interest in that early minimalism and uh, work that on the 60s in uh, primarily in the United States, was also sort of the field of interest for myself as a student in the 60s 
uh, where I went to the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, originally in architecture. I went to the school in architecture, and after about a year and a half or so in the architecture program, uh, I became very much enamored by the facilities that the school had, which were really uh, very large-scale industrial design shops, both machine shops and uh, wood shops and foundries and such, uh, that I really realized that I wanted to somehow transform uh, my interest in architecture, specifically more towards an interest in light and the utilization of light as it sort of interacts with glass. And, and the field that I was sort of mostly uh, interested in was film. All these early projects, these are done from about 1970 till about 1979, uh, are a series of films. There's about 25 of these different film uh, uh, projects. But the idea here was really how one could utilize film as a way of transposing space or transposing events in nature and reestablishing their presence in a more constructed environment, a gallery environment, museum environment that would allow you to sort of read or understand the information that was captured by the films in a very uh, different way, hopefully in a new way that allows you to sort of see the phenomenology in a, in a, in a different uh, manner. But just as an example, this is a, uh, a film project that uh, I often use just by way of illustrating uh, this general sort of body of work. And uh, this is really a, a, a river, a small river in uh, Puget Sound and it was managed by the University of Washington uh, relative to introducing different strains of salmon, genetic strains of salmon into the river uh, and to study them upon their return. And uh, what we did is we basically set up a whole, built a whole series of scaffolding over the river and used a series of film cameras to photograph down into the surface of the river. Uh, and what you would end up with are uh, essentially these films, groups of films. This is done with film. This is sort of before you know, video was really uh, in existence, uh, done through films where uh, basically they're all synchronized with each other so that in this instance you sort of see the movement of one salmon through one film frame, through a moment of darkness into the next film frame. And uh, by taking this film uh, and slightly altering the uh, timing of the films themselves, you begin to unlock different properties that are captured within the film image itself. And I think this is fundamentally just something that interests me through all the work we even do today in my studio, which is how your eye basically edits and selects information from the world around us and describes that world to you, perhaps in a very limited way. And there is this other whole body of information out there that we tend to not acknowledge or ignore, uh, and, and we, don't, we don't necessarily sort of allow it to be uh, dominant in our thinking. So what happens when you take these films, you obviously sort of look through the surface of the water, you see the movement of the fish, uh, but in reality, uh, by changing the timing slightly on the films, you realize that what you're really looking at within that sequence of images is in fact a perfectly reflected image of the sky overhead. So it's really this idea of, uh, and this is really where the whole notion of glass for me uh, finds a material presence in, in the sense that I actually think of glass as a substrate that possesses information, that the glass itself is an embodied quality of information. And that information is either reflected or transmitted or uh, somehow refracted within the glass itself. So in this case, this idea was like, how do you take a film frame image, pull it apart, and actually bring your attention to these different uh, fragments of the, uh, the filmed image? And those, uh, the film projects of which I said there's quite a few, they all obviously are all very different from each other, but they share uh, this idea of trying to investigate events that occur in nature, extracting fragments of information from those events and bringing them back into a different environment to look at them in a new way. Uh, towards the latter part of the 70s, uh, very early 80s, uh, as Mark sort of mentioned, I, 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 I've been working for the Corning Glass Works, which is sort of a technical glass company, and sort of using my salary from that to fund doing these films, uh, which were shown a lot in Germany and uh, around the United States. And uh, I realized that in some way I wanted to uh, move away from the art world uh, because towards the end of the 70s, the whole art world changed very dramatically. The period of time that I was very involved uh, was certainly that sort of post-minimalist period and really sort of the whole blossoming of uh, conceptual art and environmental art, which I, was obviously what really inspired me. 
Uh, and uh, I, I sort of towards the end of the 70s, everything became much more overshadowed by uh, painting, really, sort of expressionist painting. It's sort of like Sandro Kia and, and Kiefer and all the, all the, you know, Schnabel, all that stuff sort of happened and basically sort of flattened uh, sort of the art world from my perspective relative to investigation of ideas. Uh, so I wanted to try to find a way to manage continuing to work with conceptual ideas but shift it perhaps back towards architecture. And uh, this was a project done for a family quite a bit later, this is like eight or ten years later after that salmon migration film. But it's essentially a, a built project or, a, or a, a, a project, a proposed project that would take that filmic experience and transpose it into a built work, a permanently built work. And the idea of the gallery being an environment where uh, you're, you're expending an enormous amount of effort to set up a context or a, a work for a very limited period of time and you're also presenting that work to very much a preconditioned audience, how do you actually take some of those ideas and bring them into a, a more open public environment where the, 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 the audience obviously is not preconditioned to art, but they experience something in a much more uh, sort of original way for themselves. So this was very, uh, I use this again as an example simply because it is based on that salmon migration film. It's a bridge, as you can see, uh, it's for a family, a small river running through the property. And basically the bridge is a glass platform, it's about 100 feet long, and basically runs parallel to the length of the river itself. So the notion of crossing the river uh, is really uh, moving out on the gangway, onto the glass platform, and then over the other side of the river. So the notion of uh, having that moment in time where you are in fact engaged with the motion of the river itself and uh, experience that ecology in a deeper way uh, relative to the idea of crossing is, is really the goal here. And it's activation through light. It's basically sun falling down on the surface of the river and then reflecting back up onto the lower surface of the platform of the bridge itself. So the bridge in fact becomes a projection surface an extraction of the surface of the river, and that's the surface upon which you're walking. So it's a combination of that idea that basically you're walking on this cinematic uh, reflection of the water itself and a series of panels uh, that have a higher degree of reflectivity to them and that coalesce and sort of superimpose fragments of the surrounding landscape uh, in front of you. So a way of like using architecture uh, or installations that are permanently built to re-engage people with sort of the dynamics of light uh, around us. And then this, you know, you're watching here, is really uh, probably done about the same time, you know, I don't know, late 80s. Uh, and this was for a, a, a client in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, very beautiful landscape. Uh, it's a private chapel, a part of a, a seminary, basically. And uh, the one request from the client was really to have a totally clear glass window that they wanted to be able to sit in this environment and look out over this beautiful landscape that you see above there uh, and observe that nature uh, during the services uh, in the chapel itself. So uh, this was done with Ed Barnes. Um, I'm not sure if Ed has any buildings here on campus. He might, he did a lot of very nice university. He does have something here. Yeah. I hope a good one. I don't know, he's done some good ones. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this was, uh, he's a great architect. He was sort of a uh, early uh, graduate school design person back in the Breuer period. Uh, but anyway, the, the goal here was for myself, being charged by the client to come up with an idea for this window, was obviously going back to uh, this interest in cinematic experience. And uh, what you're looking at here are basically very tall uh, blades of glass, about 35 feet high, uh, single pieces of glass, and then they're stiffened by these uh, plates uh, horizontally, so you end up with essentially this egg shape. And, uh, you just sort of saw what happens to this window, but it's really a matter of bringing uh, qualities of the exterior environment, obviously, into the building itself. And the way it's brought in is, is perhaps of interest because you have the motion of the sky uh, outside above here, clouds moving or birds moving. Basically, that image is projected up into the upper surface of the, of the uh, reflected image. And then, as you saw in that earlier slide, there's trees outside here. Uh, and then in the summer and fall, when there are leaves on the trees and you get that motion within the leaves themselves and the trees themselves, that whole image is projected into here. So you have this uh, superimposition of landscape and skyscape sort of brought into the space 
in a very, very abstracted way, of course, but it reconnects you with the phenomenology <laughs> of events that are occurring outside in a completely different way. And uh, I guess an element of interest for me constantly is, is, is seen in the construction of the window, which is, at the time, was you know, fairly, probably one of the larger pieces of construction done in this way, which is a all silicone uh, structural glazing. But more importantly is really this idea that the window uh, here is no longer, um, as we, it was referred to earlier, like in terms of the modernist tradition, no, the window is no longer a singular membrane or a, or a plane of glass, which due to its unfortunate characteristic of being transparent is often ignored as a material, basically. The glass itself is really dismissed uh, as a material. And uh, I really have quite a very different idea about how, how you might work with glass in the sense that that boundary condition here uh, moves from the you know, singular piece of glass uh, to actually a volumetric present where the interstitial zone between the interior environment and exterior environment has expanded to the point that it becomes a device that translates the qualities of light and the qualities of the exterior environment into uh, the, the interior environment. So in a way, the window then becomes a device that can articulate and explore and devise a different reading of what's happening outside the building itself. And I'll show you some other projects shortly that uh, build upon that. Uh, I'm really just trying to show you a, a collection of projects that basically to sort of illustrate, I guess, in a way, ideas about light and the presence of light around us. And we'll work towards showing you some architectural projects. But this is a, a project for the Olympics in Sydney, uh, done in 2000, sort of designed around 1997, 1998. Uh, but it basically works on this uh, phenomenon, which is a building in New York City that you see up here. Uh, where we, uh, because we're on an island, of course, you get really remarkable weather conditions where uh, you have very, very low fog or clouds in the city itself. And then these buildings, which are uh, very intensely lit, and normally that light is reflected off the top of the building and the light escapes into the sky. You see the bright object, but you don't really see uh, the presence of the light itself because the majority of it is lost in the sky overhead. But when you get these weather conditions, that light that is normally uh, invisible uh, essentially takes on a different presence and the whole area of the city is transformed. Like you'll have eight, 10 square block areas that are completely illuminated by this one building. And you can literally see your shadow on the street uh, at that time of day. So the idea is like how to investigate uh, the principle of light interacting with uh, basically water molecules in the atmosphere, or atmospheric moisture. Uh, and uh, the, the project was really uh, for the Olympics. It's actually a bridge, uh, a bridge, a pedestrian bridge that links all of the athletes' housing and the uh, sort of parking for everybody coming to the Olympic site. It has to walk across this pedestrian bridge, and then you enter into the Olympic Park. Uh, and uh, we wanted to sort of make this threshold experience something where it would bring to your attention sort of this whole notion of water purification, water circulation in a, in a more holistic way. So what we did here is using, uh, as you can sort of see up in that third image over, trying to understand how, how you can make objects or forms or a mirage appear in space in the middle of the day under bright sun. I mean, it's sort of like how do you create things that can float in space middle of the day. So the investigation is really about setting up these uh, misting systems that uh, are used mostly for industrial purposes to create the synthetic cloud. Uh, and then using, as you can see the person in the background there, using a glass basically to bounce the sunlight back into the mist. Uh, and I guess what's of interest in terms of the optics of that is simply that if that were a conventional mirror, you would not actually see anything. You wouldn't see that object in space simply because you're looking under a full spectrum of white light into this misted atmosphere, and you're essentially bouncing back a full spectrum of light into it. They basically neutralize each other, and they're not visible. But if you filter that light, as is happening there, where you're allowing the blue light to basically pass through the glass, and then the only light wavelengths of light that are reflected back are in fact yellow light. Uh, and yellow light, of course, is something you're very sensitive to in terms of your eye. 
uh, and then these objects appear. So the principle is, you know, coming from that, demonstrated in some tests that were done, and then as you can sort of see here, a bit of the project are these masts, they're about 110 feet tall, water's pumped up through the mass, the top 15 feet of each mass is sort of misting, creating this uh, field of mist. And then this, this, this image that you're seeing here, which is this device over here, is a very, very large mirror. It's about a 15-foot square mirror that is attached to uh, a, computer, a computer device that basically tracks the sun all day long. And then that beam of sunlight, uh, which is sort of wherever the sun is in the sky, the mirror tracks it, projects a beam of light back through, uh, through that field of mist. Uh, and you see, depending on the weather conditions or the quality of atmospheric moisture, you either see fragments of light, as you're seeing here, where you get these bars of light or fragments of light, or you get continuous bars of light. And if there's quite a bit of atmospheric moisture, you actually see literally a bar going from the mirror, and it might go for literally about a mile and a half or two miles. You just see this bar of light that goes uh, through the landscape. But it's really uh, trying to bring your attention to this sort of realization of how light interacts with uh, moisture around us. So a lot of projects uh, are really explorations of qualities of light. Uh, they certainly become installations in different ways, either landscape installations or parts of buildings as installations. Uh, and then other projects become more uh, integrated with the building itself. And then this is, uh, as you may know, this is a building in New York. It's the, uh, first tower by uh, Foster, and uh, we've worked actually with their office since around 1978. Uh, we've probably done about 15 different building projects with them, starting with the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank planning. Uh, but on this particular project, uh, it's the historic base of the building, uh, completely gutted out, new tower is sort of placed above that uh, historic framework. The structure of the new tower, as you can see in the upper uh, left-hand corner there, comes up and sort of through the new space. Uh, and the issue was really the transition from moving at street level up to this elevated lobby area, which is about three, uh, three and a half floors above that. And uh, the way we try to develop this scheme is that as you enter in underneath that uh, mezzanine you see there, which is the main sort of dining room for the building, you enter through that mezzanine, you're basically looking at an inclined field of prisms, basically glass prisms that are about five feet long and about uh, six or eight inches thick. Uh, and they're designed in such a way, uh, the prisms, that uh, they're designed in such a way individually that they gather light. This is the overall lobby space here. It's an eight story building space. Uh, sort of skylights, clear story light, bring the daylight in up above use this whole prismatic glass surface as essentially a periscope to bring the daylight down and project it out to the street so that when you're walking <coughs> along the street, rather than looking into a dark building as you typically do on any building, because you can never compensate for the brightness that exists in the street itself, you're actually looking towards a brighter environment on the inside. So in the exterior, you sort of have that uh, visibility of the interior of the space working. And then simultaneously, uh, the idea here is that you use this glass surface uh, for a couple other purposes simultaneously, one of which is bringing the water, collecting the rainwater on the roof of the building, bringing the water down. There's actually a room under here with pumps and storage and everything here. We bring the rainwater down, sort of filter it, purify it, and then chill it. And then that chilled water is basically run over this glass wall, which is uh, the main entry to the building. And uh, that chilled water is essentially the dehumidification and cooling system for uh, this whole public lobby of the building. And uh, simultaneously, that water activity is uh, programmed to respond to the population of that space. So there's about 4,500 people that work in this building, and they obviously come in in waves in the morning and at lunch hour. This is a, there's a couple, several, maybe probably four or 500 people eating up here. So the noise level, obviously, is changing within the building environment, so the water uh, flow over the, over the material is both increased and decreased in order to manage the temperature, but simultaneously the acoustical quality of providing sort of a white noise uh, in the space itself. So as you come into the building, you basically transition up through this whole field of cast 
uh, glass prisms up to this new lobby. And uh, other, other types of works uh, also in New York and not quite so far away from that last uh, uh, project that I just showed you is this, this project, which is much earlier. Uh, but again, as a way, I think, of trying to uh, engage people in an urban environment with this, uh, these moments of happenstance that occur in an urban context that we often don't look at or acknowledge or recognize, of having, recognize as having any great significance, but you can construct surfaces like this. It's a very simple project. It's just a, a surface, a very responsive surface that allows the most minor qualities of light to sort of take on a more substantial presence uh, within that within the cityscape. And uh, all, it, all it is is really a background glass, uh, which comes from a solar collector, uh, which means it's made up of a whole field of tiny prisms. Uh, and then behind it is a reflective surface. So the solar collector glass sees the whole sky. It takes that sky brightness, refracts it into the glass itself. The refracted light sees a reflected surface and then tries to come back out through that prismatic surface. And basically you end up with an activated luminous wall just lit by ambient sky brightness. And then uh, projecting off of that here perpendicularly are these glass blades, uh, which uh, are, are, are not, not particularly large. Uh, they project off of the space perpendicularly. So if you're looking at a drawing of this, it's really, you know, it's just a grid, just sort of this gridded, uh, sort of elevation, and then there's just these fins that show up as little dark lines within that gridded field. Uh, but in their three-dimensional presence, what happens is that uh, they pick up all this, as I said, sort of these ambient qualities of light. So you have moments of the day, like the upper left-hand corner, where there's not really any direct light, there's very little direct light on it at the point of the day. Uh, you're mostly reflected light back on the wall. The next image is really when the wall, in fact, is in complete shadow. The wall, the sun has, in fact, gone over the building. And what, what you're seeing there is really uh, sort of ambient patches of light that are being reflected from three, four, five, six blocks away from other buildings. And those ambient moments of light then take on a more sort of remarkable presence when it strikes this type of responsive surface. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's really this combination of uh, experience in the sense that if you walk down the street, basically if you walk down through the street here, uh, this whole wall goes through a very dramatic shift. Two people looking at the wall from two different angles see two completely different things. And it's this whole idea that at any time of day or any time of the year when you look at the surface, it is unique to that period of time or that moment in time. And uh, that's, that's somewhat critical uh, in, in all of the work we do is that it's not you're not constructing something that's static by any means. The construction itself is static, yes, but your position relative to it and the position of the sun relative to it are really the, the mechanisms which uh, activate its whole surface. And of course, the, one, of the, one of the ideas here is sort of illustrated there where uh, the, the notion of using the fin was really to break this, uh, this approach to dealing with surfaces, which is uh, obviously just sort of a decorative brick pattern by, that the architects produce, but it, it, it consistently leaves you with this as the surface. But the idea here is that the glass fin uh, suggests, in terms of its perceptual presence, that it's moving through the glass plane and entering into a space beyond the wall. So the wall is, again, this idea that the wall is no longer simply a surface, but it takes on a vo volumetric presence. So the same way I described the chapel window, this whole idea of light behaving uh, in a volumetric way is, is really critical to uh, a lot of the things we do. Um, this is a house done with uh, Vince James, an architect from Minneapolis, uh, for an elderly couple up in Minneapolis uh, who had moved from uh, living in the country to uh, where they have a fantastic art collection uh, on a very large property moved into the city, Minneapolis, to be near the Walker Arts Center, where most of their collection uh, is today. Uh, but they wanted to maintain a lifestyle of living in the country. They wanted to feel like they were still uh, sort of in, the con in a country, even though they're living in a, in a conventional neighborhood. Uh, so basically, the organization of the house, and we worked a lot on this, like sort of excavating the property and positioning windows and, and views in such a way that you saw no other buildings. Uh, and then there was one 
uh, one particular window, which is the one that's up this little flight of stairs there. And you can sort of see the, perhaps see the problem. There's a, there's a wall, stone wall, and a fence. And in fact, there's a neighboring building right opposite that window. So the window would be in full scale, like say, right where I'm putting my hand here, then there'd be a building about this far away from it. So there, there was a very large window, and uh, there, in fact, is like no view. There's no view that you would want to have of that window. So we constructed this device, which I'll show you in a moment, a little more about it, but this just gives you an idea of what, it, what it's about. Uh, it's, it's a little mock-up of the window. It's a series of mirrors that run uh, horizontally. Uh, the mirrors are actually tilted out, a little about, about a 40 degree angle, tilted out. Uh, basically, they bring the sky image, the image of the sky directly overhead is brought down into the window plane. Uh, there's then a series of lenses that read the image off of the mirror. And then by positioning a field of translucent glass, the lens is then, at a certain distance, the, lens, the focal length of the lens then resolves that image. So it's essentially a very simple optical device that's trying to do three or four different things at the same time. One is, of course, bringing this new image down into the window plane which I'm describing. <laughs> other that it's doing is, is essentially trying to capture this phenomenon, which is something that we really don't see, uh, or very rarely see, and that's, uh, that's the effect of uh, basically under a tree, any tree, on any sunny day, anywhere, uh, you have this organization of the crown of the tree, where you have leaves <coughs> happening three-dimensionally within the tree canopy itself, and inevitably there are little pinholes created three-dimensionally through the crown of a tree where the sun passes through what is effectively a pinhole camera and then projects itself on the ground below the tree. So you don't see this except in this condition where this is actually during an eclipse. And every one of these images is actually, it's actually the sun and the moon passing in front of it. You can see it there. There's hundreds of them there. But it's basically something that's happening every day. I mean, if you, under any tree where we think it's shade is in reality tens of thousands of images of the sun projected there at the same time. We just don't recognize it. So the window is trying to figure out a way to uh, explore that opportunity and sort of make that sense of, that sensation or recognition of pinhole images of the sun to uh, be projected. So this is the window. It's, it's, you know, it's not particularly large. It's maybe twice the size of that projected image. Uh, but you can see what it is. Each of these lenses is projecting the top of the tree and sort of the tree canopy at a distance, probably about 40 or 50 yards away. And then at certain times of the day like this, where the sun is coming from the back, it's actually projecting individual leaves from the very top of that same tree. So you're seeing the same object at two different scales simultaneously sort of superimposed on one or the other. And then thirdly, these discs that you see up above here are in fact pinhole images of the sun. So those are moving, they're, they're jumping around, they're moving constantly as the wind moves or the sun moves. Those pinhole cameras are constantly being reconstructed within the crown of the tree. So uh, I guess the whole point of describing this to you is essentially that, uh, again, this notion of the window is something that's, you know, and the way we treat windows is hugely simplistic. Uh, and I think that there are ways that you can begin to explore or understand windows as much more constructive devices in terms of constructing different realities. You can basically bring information from other vantage points and define a new exterior environment that is otherwise, it's there, but it's not constructed the way you're choosing to construct it. Uh, when you do something like this. So it's just an area that interests me, like how, how you can gather this visual information and reform uh, sort of this other sense of reality uh, outside the building. And uh, a lot of these projects, uh, this is with Grimshaw, uh, perhaps deal with light in a more, uh, in, in, in one respect, in a more, cons a more uh, conservative way or a more conventional way in terms of its historic utilization. And this is a, a station that's being built in New York right now. It's a new subway transit interconnection downtown, just near the World Trade Center site. Uh, and obviously in New York, we're somewhat constricted by taller buildings. Uh, so the aperture to the sky is very limited and it's at a particular angle. So the top of this form is basically directed towards 
both an aperture where it gets direct sunlight, but also towards an aperture where it always gets sky brightness uh, coming into it. And this form of the reflector is designed so that as the light comes in, depending on the time of year, you get primary or tertiary uh, secondary reflections in the dome, but the whole principle is bringing that light down into these below ground spaces. And as you look up at this, uh, as you can see in that little uh, image at the left there, you in fact, it's, it's almost like a sundial. I mean, basically it, you, it describes to you where in the sky the sun is and what time of year it is uh, simply by its position on the shell of this uh, reflector. And as part of that uh, project is uh, this whole transformation of the interconnection of the subway lines. Uh, and obviously, in New York, our subway, subway lines primarily are running north-south, and this is really an east-west connector. So it links, it links all the different subway lines together. And uh, what we're trying to play with here is uh, setting up a, a, another reading of a tunnel space from the point of view that all of the lighting for the tunnel uh, the tunnels is actually outside the space. It's actually a service corridor outside of this. All the lights are basically in that service corridor and they come through the skin of the wall itself. So uh, again, this, this idea of perception of space of light is that if the light is not within the space where you are, like here, you know, we're in the space, the lights are in the space with us, you don't have a sense of what's beyond this room. But if the light is in fact coming from outside the space coming in, you have a sense of much greater spatial uh, opportunities uh, within these things. So a lot of the work we do is, is trying to figure out how, uh, how you manipulate and utilize light uh, in a different way to change uh, how we think about it or experience it. And then this, again, is a fairly straightforward project, but it, 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 it sort of a, explores this potential of how much power there is in sunlight and how little we actually understand about how to use it. And this is a, this is a building, it's 100 and, uh, about 150 feet tall. It's an atrium space. This, this the piece itself is about 130 feet. Uh, it's a fairly narrow atrium space. And as you might imagine, the proportion of that, of that space is about 60 feet long. It's 145 feet deep. Uh, and it's only about eight feet wide. So uh, the fact of the matter is without any <coughs> manipulation of the daylight, basically you'd get light in there for about, you know, maybe about 35 minutes or 40 minutes a day, and otherwise it'd be a relatively dark space. So what you're looking at is a device which is really a tall conical structure that runs that full height, sort of a cone made out of a particular type of prismatic glass, and then it's uh, basically wrapped with uh, a fabric around it. And uh, the principle here is that up on the roof, uh, as you can see on the top there, is a device uh, which is not, not so large. It's about, you know, maybe about three and a half feet square. It's a mirror, again, that tracks the sun all day long. And then that sunlight is basically bounced off of a field of smaller secondary mirrors. And then that sunlight is dropped down inside this cone. You're looking into the top of it right here. Uh, it's basically inside that glass cone. and. Uh, this light, as you can see, comes down, uh, down at full height of the building, and then a portion of the light is left to basically distribute itself down on the ground. But this, again, so a 140 feet tall atrium space is completely daylit, but it's being daylit. This is like the point I'm trying to make is that the window or the mirror is about the size of an average window in a house. I mean, it's no bigger than your average window in an office or, or a, your residence. And that's all the light that's being used. And it's all a matter of how you judiciously and sort of strategically utilize the light over its whole length. It's the prismatic effect of the glass is basically harvesting light uniformly down its whole length over that whole, uh, that whole surface. And then most importantly is obviously how we read light. And, and, and what, what it's demonstrating is that the same light is basically being seen in three or four different ways. One is you're seeing its refractive presence from the glass prisms itself. You're seeing its sort of translucent or transmissive presence as it passes through the fabric. You can sort of see it residing on the surface of the fabric. And then the light again sort of falls and resides on the surface of the building itself. So the same light 
effectively, uh, is basically being utilized in multiple ways and then perceptually gives you the sense of enormous amount of brightness and, and light. And it's uh, just this, this, this way of working with light which we tend to not consider, uh, which again is this notion of light as a volumetric presence. If you basically just drop that beam of light down the whole space and you ended up with something like this on the ground floor, it would obviously have no benefit or presence uh, along the full length of that atrium space. So the whole idea here is lighting all of those offices. You're bringing daylight into all of those offices all the way down, and then finally bringing light to a place that had no daylight at the base of the building. So just an example of uh, trying to think about uh, how we might better uh, manage the use of light. Uh, and then some, some of these things that we you know, continue to still do is just explorations of, you know, this is coming back to some of those earlier film projects in a way, uh, but again, it's sort of dealing with light in the sense of, this is a museum uh, downtown in, in Manhattan. Uh, it's actually a museum of uh, Jewish heritage. Uh, and it's right on the uh, harbor. And uh, we sort of built a camera into the, uh, up on the roof of the building. The camera is sort of programmed to look at the harbor, look at New York Harbor. And then with the, some of the software written for it, uh, the, the, within that view of the harbor, it's actually isolating the brightest points of reflected light off the surface of the river and then brings it back into the museum. And then we sort of develop this as a very large LED surface uh, where we've pulled the LED uh, basically pixels quite far apart so you can't, you can't recognize what it is you're seeing. But by then positioning a uh, piece of diffused glass in front of it, uh, the light sort of reconstructs the image and uh, what you have is this, uh, in front of this field of LEDs where you don't understand the move, movement or motion or image, the image is reconstructed by the glass and you realize that you're actually looking at, uh, you're looking at a fragment of the water uh, that's further out beyond you in the harbor itself. And uh, it's uh, maybe looking at the water in fairly close proximity to you or it might be looking at water half a mile away or different areas, but sort of bringing in this very abstracted, modified view of uh, the, the quality of water and movement of water uh, as it exists out in the harbor. So it's, it's, it's actually meant to be, frankly, it's a meditation space as you move from part of their collection to uh, another part of the collection. And then uh, this is uh, a project sort of in the same neighborhood, uh, roughly. Uh, and it's in, uh, actually fairly close to my studio, uh, it's in downtown Manhattan, just north of the World Trade Center site. And uh, it's actually Tower 7, uh, World Trade Center Tower 7, which is uh, that parallelogram shape in the blue <coughs> of the World Trade Center site. The original Tower 7 was this whole site here. And uh, Tower 7 was, in fact, a bigger building than the tall towers in terms of its square footage. Uh, and this is the building that collapsed in the afternoon. Uh, in 9-11, when the two big towers which were across the street here collapsed, this building caught on fire because it had a lot of fuel storage in it. Uh, and then eventually, at the end of the day, it sort of, uh, sort of caved in on itself because of a softening of some of the big transfer trusses uh, at the base of the building. Uh, but the building was critical to downtown Manhattan in the sense that it's a power substation. Uh, and this building had to be uh, reconstructed relatively quickly after the 9-11 uh, event um, uh, in order to get these transformers back up and running uh, to provide power not necessarily just back to the World Trade Center site to a bunch of downtown Manhattan. So uh, there was an initiative uh, literally that started, we got involved in this maybe about three or four weeks after the building collapsed uh, with Skidmore. And uh, the way oftentimes we get hired on a project like this is that we're, we're in fact hired by the owner, the building owner. Uh, directly, as is Skidmore, and then we're charged with obviously working with Skidmore, but then our charge becomes, uh, in this case, primarily the development of the exterior skin of the building for a, for a client we worked with before. So the building ends up being basically a power substation on the ground floor. So the very large transformer vaults uh, to the north and south, and then the lobby is, in fact, sort of squeezed between those transformer vaults, the loading docks at the back, and then the core is uh, sort of rotated at that angle to maximize 
uh, the number of cars available. And the whole building is basically determined by, as you may well know, uh, the ability to service the height of the tower is contingent entirely on uh, the serviceability of those elevators providing access to the floors. So you see the building starting here on the upper right-hand corner. This is a large concrete base of the building, which is the power substation. It's about eight stories tall. Uh, and then upon that will sit a steel frame office tower, which is about 50 stories. Um, but the issue of the power substation was really uh, that uh, not only does the wall have to be permeable to air, like naturally ventilated for the transformers, but as the whole World Trade Center site, which is right around the corner there, was going to be transformed now into a cultural space and a different, a different function, basically, than, it's, uh, than it had with its podium uh, presence over the last 35, 40 years. Uh, it was going to be much more ur urbane and sort of active and street life around the base of the building. So the, the interest immediately was like, how are you going to deal with this concrete box uh, and enliven the streets and deal with all of the other issues of uh, performance uh, that's necessary on any of these, of these projects. But uh, what we did is we developed a system that's made out of these extruded uh, stainless steel prisms. These are extruded prisms which uh, on the outer surface that you see here, uh, they're rotated slightly. There's one group that's parallel to the face of the building and others are, are slightly rotated. Uh, and then behind that, about eight inches, is then another layer of a finer grid uh, stainless steel mesh. Uh, and the principle here is that uh, the company we worked with is up in Minneapolis that does uh, mostly mining equipment. The principle was uh, a surface that performs with daylight reflectivity. Uh, and let me to come back to that. Daylight reflectivity, where you get daylight bouncing off the surface of the building, your eye sort of stops at that outer surface. And then at nighttime, uh, a built in uh, LED system that uh, illuminates the inner surface of the, of the wall itself. So the light is always moving between outer surface, inner surface, along the skin of the building. And at no time, in this particular drawing, shows you with solid concrete behind it. But in most instances, there's actually transformers and working space behind it where men are servicing those uh, transformers. But the idea is, again, this notion of uh, uh, volumetric light, that the light actually has this uh, uh, presence on site that's uh, more substantial than simply uh, falling on a, on a single surface. And the principle of the building is really, uh, organizational principle of the building, really had to do with the specific character of light in Manhattan. Where we have great light uh, again, because we're right on the river, right on the ocean, you got amazing light. You have that atmospheric moisture, which uh, brings a little different type of materiality to the quality of light. So the whole tower is organized around this idea of light. So the base of the building is this zone, uh, a zone that basically wraps around the building of volumetric light, and then the transition, uh, as you can see here, the base of the building goes up about eight stories and then, then transitions into the occupied floors up at about level 10. Um, and the, the idea was to maintain that uh, volume of light up through the whole skin of the building. So you're not necessarily looking at a uh, monolithic surface on the, on the exterior of the building, but you're in fact looking at what appears to be a field of floating panels of glass that are set in front of this other luminous surface behind it. And the way that's basically done is shown here, uh, which is the structural or spandrel section of the building where all the steel framing is at each fourth floor uh, elevation. This little model shows this is the top of one glazing element at the ceiling, office ceiling. And this panel at the bottom, basically the glass goes right over the floor slab. The glass passes right by the floor slab and is sealed to the back of the slab. So you get no break in the glass. It's like one, one big sheet of glass, 12 foot sheet of glass that comes down. Then it overhangs the spandrel. And then the spandrel is actually uh, a very specific curve to it. And it's made out of, out of a very finely ribbed uh, material, stainless steel material at the back. And then at the sill uh, is actually positioned a, uh, uh, a blue stainless steel reflector. And the, and the uh, principle sort of shown to you at the top there, which is uh, the top right, which is simply that when you normally are looking up at a building, particularly buildings of this scale, uh, 
the sun, of course, is coming from overhead. So a lot of the surfaces that you look at from below are, in fact, in shade or shadow. The highlight of the building is, is, is from above. And normally, the surfaces you see from below are always shadow. And that, sometimes that shadow can give dimension to the building. But other times, uh, the building appears to have very, very uh, sort of flat, and to my mind, rather dead sort of presence. So the, the goal here is you see this from a construction uh, elevator outside the building. This blue reflector basically wraps around the whole building. And the principle uh, is demonstrated there is simply that the sunlight or bright sky brightness comes down. The blue light is bounced back up into this spandrel section. So that from the street, what you look up at is act actually blue light uh, in the uh, spandrel. And uh, one of the problems with blue light, of course, it's probably self-evident, the sky's blue. We're too familiar with blue, or I doesn't see blue because there's too much of it around. Uh, the, I, the idea is that that blue fills this zone on the building and it emerges from the blue of the sky itself. So the intent is that the <laughs> glass panels uh, feel as if they're floating against the sky itself behind it. Uh, but again, it's this idea of volumetric light uh, and how it's read. And I think that the most important thing in, in many respects for us in this in this type of a project is that uh, we're all very well aware of the need to sort of improve daylighting in office environments to make a better workspace and all of that, uh, which we try to maximize and reduce electric lighting and all, all those critical things relative to uh, good practice. Uh, but I think there's another uh, parallel responsibility that uh, we're trying to understand a little better and, and practice as well which is when you build a structure, you're basically occupying a public resource. You're occupying this public resource of daylight as an urban resource. And uh, there needs to be, uh, I think, clearly sort of this understanding of how, if that resource is being privatized, meaning utilized by the occupant or owner of the building, uh, how does one in turn uh, have a recipro reciprocal responsibility for the quality of light that exists in the public realm outside the building? So it's this idea that buildings or you know, enclosure systems can have this sort of symbiotic relationship to both exterior and interior in terms of giving back <laughs> to those environments uh, in a much sort of richer way that allows you to sort of read them in a, in a, in a much more complex way. So this is just you know, one moment in time when all those daylighting reflectors light up you know, along one facade. But it's, again, one of these structures which uh, completely changes you know, at any time of the day or the year. And um, I think that uh, what I might just talk about briefly is sort of showing you some of these projects. And uh, we've uh, also just recently finished a fairly large museum project in uh, uh, Israel. I don't know, I have another five, ten minutes maybe, something, yeah. Um, but I think this, this idea of light, I guess what's happening for, uh, just to give you a little back up a little bit, give you a little bit of a picture of where our practice is going. I've sort of given you a little bit of a travel log relative to uh, exploring ideas and how these have sort of resulted in bits and pieces of buildings and larger scale fragments of buildings than ultimately, you know, whole buildings. Uh, and our practice today is, is in fact, I mean, we are doing full building projects where you know, clients are approaching us to do the whole thing. And uh, one of those is this project in Israel that's recently finished and another uh, museum in Denmark, but uh, one project that's uh, sort of closest to me right now and one that uh, we're trying to develop is really for the, the government of Greenland, which is an is Inuit, sort of a native uh, indigenous government uh, for the Greenlandic people. Uh, and we've sort of been hired, this came back from there uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, been hired to actually try to understand uh, this other phenomenon, which I've been working on teaching in Norway and Denmark over the last four or five years uh, during the winter, actually, uh, specifically during the winter and specifically during January when often there are overcast skies. Uh, and there's this general presumption that there is no light in the winter time, uh, daytime or nighttime. And uh, something that we've begun to understand, I think, which is, uh, I think, quite fascinating and, and uh, I think has some remarkable possibilities in terms of referencing it back to our own understanding is that uh, uh, is, is, is qualities of what I refer to as night light. I mean, we refer to daylight, but there is, in fact, this other uh, 
parallel universe in terms of light that exists at night. And it's uh, certainly self-evident when you go to places like Greenland, uh, where it is extremely dark in the wintertime. You might have just a little low gray light during the day. Uh, but at nighttime, it is remarkably bright in the middle of the night. I mean, it's pitch black out, but it's actually bright out. Uh, and it's, this, it's a very remarkable thing where you have this whole field of stars overhead and the ground plane is the brightest source of light, of course, because it's generally <coughs> snow on the ground. So the whole quality of light is one that uh, is coming from below rather than from above. And it has some, I think, some very intriguing properties to it, uh, which we're trying to explore. And some of those properties have to do with trying to understand what is a shadow, like what are shadows? Because we tend to, as I mentioned earlier about the presence of those images that occur, like say under a tree, images of the sun that occur under a tree, we actually really don't, I don't feel anyway, we actually don't really even understand the complexity of it, something as simple as a shadow. Like what is a shadow? We sort of keep it on this very, you know, uh, sort of dynastic understanding of what it is, but it's something much more complex than that. And it's seen oftentimes, I think, in these other environments where a shadow, in fact, it becomes something. If you have an object in, the, in these winter months in Scandinavia, particularly, where you have this uniform gray sky overhead, basically the brightness is coming from all angles simultaneously, uh, and you have a brighter plane uh, coming from below. If you actually position an object uh, out in that, in that field, uh, the shadow, in fact, is a ring. There is a ring around the object. It's a perfectly symmetrical ring that frames the object. And there's a hybridization between the reflected image of the object and the shadow of the object itself, that the shadow becomes this superimposition of its own presence as a reflection simultaneously with its presence as a shadow. So it's a combination of both absence of light and presence of light simultaneously. So there, there, there's a very remarkable sort of properties that happen that we, I think in many ways, have sort of desensitized ourselves to those events. And uh, I think in a way, we need to somehow understand uh, the complexities of light that exists around us and try to understand how to bring them into play relative to, you know, whatever, maybe not things this scale, but uh, bring them back into play where uh, it becomes a much more engaging sort of humanist environment where we enrich our sort of recognition of nature around us, even though we live in a, a, a greater and increasingly urban situation. That how does nature reinvest itself with our urban presence? So I think there's a, a huge field there that uh, honestly hasn't really been explored very much. Uh, and I think just by going to look at some of these different environments, you begin to see uh, see some of these things that are, I think, very open-ended questions in terms of our own perception of uh, light uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. So, um, anyway, that, that sort of give you a little summary of what we do in my studio. Uh, and uh, I think in a way, I guess in terms of speaking to students, I guess just the trajectory has always been one which is uh, deeply, deeply interested in our experience uh, relative to uh, the symbiotic relationship with nature, I mean, how we re-engage with nature uh, in, a, in a very meaningful way today uh, in, built, in our built environment, and how, for me, that's been this long-term exploration of light and the presence of light, and how, how we can try to unlock the information that is within light, uh, which is something we completely overlook. We, we reduce light, typically, down to this understanding of a photon and this sort of approach to light where what I call a sterile photon, uh, which is sort of this, this artificial source of light as opposed to uh, what I think of as more of like an, an embodied photon, which is a photon that is uh, embedded with a richness of information that registers its history. I mean, the photon itself has a history to it. And as I said, like if you're in Greenland and you're looking up at stars over its head, that history is hundreds of millions of years of light that's falling on the Earth simultaneously. It's something we don't really pay attention to, but I think there is this, you know, a physicist would disagree with this, but they sort of like this principle that there are embodied and sterile photons, and there is this sort of differentiation between light and sort of the quality and, and meaning uh, that light actually has. Um, but anyway, uh, 
I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions uh, on some of these things, whether it's about light in general or about projects. I'd be happy to answer any questions. shown a few examples of how one might, might do that. Either There's either the opportunity to collect light, of course. I mean, collecting light meaning that you're redirecting light from other sources and concentrating it on a particular location, which is really working with those things like heliostats or just surfaces that are more uh, about gathering light. Or it's really more about something like this, where the surfaces themselves are more highly responsive to light. I think this is, the whole issue is perception. I mean, it's, it's a huge, you know, we don't realize, we, you know, we just think you need to have all this light around you. You don't really need a lot of light to perceive it as being bright. I mean, it's, 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 there's a whole different level of trying to understand the qualities of light. But in an urban environment, there's, you know, there's obviously many, many different ways of bringing the light in, or making people aware of its presence in a different way. Uh, so we just, you know, I think, I hope that there was enough examples of how. Yeah, no, 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 I, do I, mean, I was actually thinking about um, bringing light in as a, uh, I mean, of course, not as, uh, not as a public or social policy, but a potential event, I guess. But I, I think that's something to explore. Right. Yeah. So I guess the obvious question for me is, uh, how, how do you design it? When I think back to the early peaks where, where lights uh, uh, sort of medium to communicate information, but it's really just sort of the medium by which the data is brought to the front. Right. And it almost right. seems like a sketch part idea could target that and then you experiment as you said in different, different right. setups or so on of them. As opposed to some of these full scale things, I'm thinking of the reflective piece I like so much with the glass bar sticking out in New York City right. for right. years, where it's almost like you need the full scale effect before you can say yes, that's it, that's what we're doing. And so are you drawing these on a computer with lighting software programs? Are you modeling them full scale? And uh, is your decision more about the sort of idea of light? Well, is it think, of data or is it well, no, well, no, well, no, you hit on you've hit on sort of two things. I mean, one is one is, yeah, I mean in general, I think of light as information. That light is embodied or embedded with information. And, and our role, I see it, is unlocking that information, making that information decipherable. Uh, and that can follow a couple different tracks. Like on films, it's, it's more, you can almost construct and deconstruct the information, as you say, almost in a more digital way, in terms of how you control it and how you perceive it. Uh, and then it becomes slightly different exercise when you're confronted with the overlay of performance requirements, which we're all, of necessity, uh, hopefully enjoy dealing with, uh, which are issues here. I mean, we're dealing with, you know, weather, you know, heating performance, thermal performance, seismic performance, blast performance in these buildings. The whole project is embedded with a whole other agenda of performance, and then simultaneously wanting it to read primarily about its quality of life. And uh, in this case, uh, I think I do read this whole building as a register of not the individual pieces, but the overall construction as a register of the information embedded in light at this particular site, at this particular location in Manhattan. You can see this building from a couple miles away, and it has its own presence you know, at that distance. It has another presence at, you know, from Central Park, and has another presence from you know, near it. So you're always sort of like trying to gauge what, how the building reads relative to those different uh, you know, vantage points. But, it is, it is trying to embed with the embed, embed the building with uh, you know this whole this whole sense of light participating constantly within a volumetric presence, and, and that that I think is uh, one of the few ways we can sort of explore like all these buildings because you're dealing with all the issues of budget and constructability and all this as well. But once you begin pulling the surfaces apart. 
apart and allowing the light to register in changing ways of relationship to one another, I think it starts defining a richer relationship between those two surfaces. So it's actually volumetric light. It's how, how does the light actually fill this void between the outer surface and the inner surface? So it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you're trying to work at both ends of it at the same time. This the presence of light, in this case, more phenomenological, right? And but the way you describe the later projects, though, are they only ever test, are they tested full scale, or is, it literally a, is there a software way to ever even see what this is going to be like ahead of time? Uh, well, I, I guess, uh, yeah, then we, we do, you know, you know, we'd start very, very small scale. You know, actually, it starts with a drawing. Actually, like the drawings, there was a very simple sketch that explored this idea, which had a lot to do with could you, in fact, accomplish that detail where the glass, the double glazed glass unit, basically just slides by the floor slab and it's sealed at the back. It's something that's never been done before. Normally, you break the glass and you mill in there, and then you, then, then you immediately lost the the sensibility of these glass plates sort of descending down the frame of the building. It starts as little drawings based on, you know, just experience of wanting to, wanting to somehow establish these two relationships. And then it began to develop into this, you know, reflector idea. And then I think there's one, you know, this, this, you know, we'd work very small scale. And then this is actually our studio. We actually build full scale mock-ups in our studio. Um, so you start with smaller scale things. You deal with some of those material explorations like on the upper right hand side. So you're sort of collecting all these pieces of information of how you might you know, coalesce the idea and then eventually it sort of results in, you know, there's probably three or four versions of this before we actually figured it out. And then, uh, and then you sort of just keep refining it. But we work in, you know, half of our studio is actually set up to build things. So we sort of go through all of that. We certainly do some lighting analysis work. So we do radiance and all those types of things, of course. Uh, but the reality for, for myself is that it's more understanding this almost intuitively and then empirically when we build these, these models. So. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. But I, I'm curious, Lewis Kahn once said something along the lines of, we understand light through its absence. And I'm wondering if you ever find yourself designing darkness as well as light in order to achieve a certain kind of desired visual effect. Right. Well, I think that's a little bit what I was trying to get at is that this whole thing that we're trying to explore now, I mean, yes, I obviously think about darkness as, well, I mean, what is the boundary between light and dark? I have no idea. I mean, I mean, I don't know what the boundary is. What is the boundary between light and dark? Because on the one hand, we're saying there's light within darkness. And I think in the same way, there's, you know, darkness within light. I mean, there's sort of these, these sort of very sort of complex interrelationships, you know, that are going on that we don't acknowledge. We tend to simplify everything to black and white, light and dark. It's, you know, the world is very simple to understand that way, but it's not really understanding anything. It's just sort of simplifying your life. Uh, and I understand for myself that the more you delve into the complexities, the more remarkable it becomes. Uh, and somewhere in you know, somewhere in that is, you know, I think another common thing was, you know, you know, you know, the light reveals architecture or whatever some of those things are. I mean, I, I actually have sort of an opposite take on that: is that you know, the architecture should reveal the light. I mean, it's the light that's for me. You know, supersedes that, and the architecture should be about the revealing of its presence. And, uh, and I think it's sort of getting at the same point, but it's sort of coming at it from a different, a different direction. Yeah. We have time for one more. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to refer back to the first question because I think a part of that was um, whether uh, there could be uh, a tangible social effect that happens with bringing different qualities of light or um, in in urban yeah. spaces. I, I know there's the, the subway. I was looking at that subway tunnel and thinking, right. wow, what a difference that would make um, to uh, going through a really long subway tunnel experience having that right. type of light. But in real um, urban decay areas, is there? A, do you think there's a potential for that to actually uplift the, the spirit uh, of people that have? 
Well, yeah, no, I, well, well let, me, let me give you the example. I didn't really explain the project that we're doing in Greenland, is, which is um, we're trying to actually readdress the urban planning. Like in, in the, the cities are very big, first of all. But the capital is the city of Nook, which is about 16,000 people. Um, and uh, what's happened there is that uh, the indigenous people, the Inuit people who are there, uh, obviously have historically a different understanding of darkness than we have. And what's happened is they basically have overlaid their cities with a conventional sort of German or European street lighting and presence of light and all these things that, uh, in a way, uh, I think have removed them from a richer understanding of the qualities of light that they inherently have always had or understood. So in a way, sort of cutting them off from, uh, I think, a more unique way of trying to rethink the use of light in their cities. And so that's, our, that's the job we have, is like, how are we going to replan the towns in terms of their lighting and even organization of focal points within the towns to create areas where light is seen as something very remarkable and has a more unique presence within the overall context of the city. So we organize key points within the city and basically drop the whole level of light in the rest of the city. Uh, so in that instance, yeah, we're trying to sort of rethink, rethink the understanding of life in a darker context. But if you extrapolate it from that to your question specifically, I think that there undoubtedly would be ways to uh, it's, it's, it's pretty self-evident. I mean, let's get away from sodium vapor lights everywhere, and you're trying to illuminate every square inch of land, you know, so supposedly for safety. Uh, but there would probably be a, a very remarkable transformation. So again, you did this thing where you actually focused light and made it a much more exceptional experience, and it really diminished its presence elsewhere. Uh, we, this is something I just said. I said earlier is that we we think we need more light than we actually do. We can operate on far less light at nighttime and still be safe and secure and see people and all of that. But uh, I think you could use light as a much more powerful, transformative piece like within urban environments. Yeah, definitely. It's just that we tend to broad brush everything and then nothing has any outstanding characteristics or presence of its own within that. Completely model, monotone approach to the city's Great, thank you again. Okay, great. Thanks very much.